My name is Mike Sasso. I'm a reporter here in the Atlanta Bureau. I'm happy to be here. Um, so what we're going to talk about, um, so all of you, ha many of you are managers. You have power over some of your company's finances. Uh, but a big question is, you know, when do you take the plunge and do some of these technologies? We're going to be talking a little bit about that and about, you know, frankly, some of these technologies, are they applicable at all? One of the, the things we'll talk about is you know, sometimes you have technology that sounds great, but uh, it, they discover that it doesn't really have many uses. So I think we're going to start with a video. Um, I'm sorry, I should introduce our panelists first. On the end here, we have uh, Giuseppe Riva, Chief Executive Officer of SCM Group North America. And he's uh, based up uh, based here in the North North Atlanta area. Um, we have in the middle we have Mike Sutcliffe, of uh, Group Chief Executive for Accenture Digital, and on the end here we have Arya Basu, uh, who has a very long title: Visual Information Specialist for Emory University's Digital Visualization Laboratory. So let's start. I think we're going to start with a video from something Giuseppe and SCM Group are doing where they're actually putting this uh, augmented reality into practice. Giuseppe, um, so you're in the wood, your, your company, SCM Group, is a large, uh, I believe, Italian-based manufacturer. You make, you make woodworking machines, uh, some machines that are uh, involved in plastics, um, some other materials. And here we have a technician, um, and you've outfitted them with, with, with some smart glasses and some augmented reality capabilities so that he can actually you know, repair uh, a defect on the spot. So take us through what's happening there. And specifically, what were you trying to do? Why did you implement this? Why did you go down the augmented reality road? Yes, it's very important in today's economy. I think this is a situation that we are all facing in the manufacturing arena to be able to maintain our enterprises very lean, to respond as quick as possible. Nobody wants to stock anything anymore. Nobody wants to have in-process um, materials anymore. So uh, to achieve this situation, we have to be able to rely on our equipments on the floor, on our process on the floor. So uh, the number one task is to avoid the machine, the process stops. But anyway, when it happens, uh, the next escalation is to respond as quick as possible. So this technology that we developed with a couple of partners is allowing us to, to be as close as possible uh, to the issue that we are facing. Um, today, when you have to deploy a technician or a service, generally speaking, uh, you have to respond to certain criteria. Geography is one, but the competence, the skills that are needed specifically is even the main driver. So how we can combine the best of the two situations? If now we can have the proper skills in a remote position, we can, uh, we can select the closest uh, support, and why not? Even somebody already on the floor, not necessarily anymore a technician that we deploy from our organization, and guiding through this person or through the platform that we created, um, we can respond to the issue very quickly, very timely, and in a very effective way, economically speaking, that at the end of the day, it's pretty important for all, for all of our organizations. So we have a win-win situation between the supplier of the service and the customer at the end receiving the, receiving the service. I'm just curious, the gentleman who was, 
or the, I guess, the expert technician who was, who was fielding the call. Where, where was he, you know, presuming that was a real, really happening? Where is he? Can he be anybody, anywhere in the world? You, yes. The, um, uh, the technician executing the job on the field is not a real one. <laughs> he staged there. But the, actually, the guy that was uh, supporting the case uh, uh, from at the remote position is one of our guys in the factory in Italy. And the beauty of this technology is, again, that you can have an escalation of skills when you're facing an issue on the floor. Um, typically, if you talk about modern machinery, the electrotechnical, the electronics component of the machine, if we open the electrical cabinet of a modern machine, it can be overwhelming. Um, so it's also a matter of the proper skills in the different situations. So this technology allows to respond with all these criteria depending on the need. So you can have multiple channels connected at the same time, and specifically in this case, the, the support was coming directly from the factory because it might happen that during the escalation in the pipeline, the skills necessary to, to solve the problem, you have to go back to the factory originally. So that's one of the advantage of narrowing down the distance. Okay. Um, and, and just take us through, you, you were mentioning to me on the phone a little bit about some of the clients. You sell this as a service, essentially. You, you offer this to your, your large manufacturing clients. Um, can you name a couple of those clients, yeah. what they're doing with this, and then more importantly, how much you're charging them for this? Well, <laughs> yeah, there are um, uh, 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 multiple benefits. Uh, there is a data benefit that is for our own organization. Um, I, we all go through a situation when we sell uh, our goods that we have the warranty period, and since then you have the post sales that you have to take care of. And um, we all have a learning curve when we have uh, technical services that we have to provide. So the first benefit is inside our organization, uh, have the possibility to, to, to uh, grow faster the new talent that become part of the team through this technology, uh, to respond quickly when uh, we are during the warranty, the warranty period. Um, uh, passing over the phase, um, we uh, option this service to our customers. Uh, as, as you said earlier, uh, we work in, um, uh, we, we sell machines, different technologies uh, to companies that are processing woodworking, plastic fibers. So we go from the aerospace to actually furniture or rooms to go that not far away from here and, and, and so on. So these are some of the accounts that are appealed by this technology and they are taking advantage of. Um, uh, and and, and what, we, what we charge is uh, uh, we have two components in this technology. One is the hardware, and one is the, uh, the software, the platform that we develop. Uh, so there is a license component for the software, and there is the hardware. Depending on the number of users, the economy can change, but the beauty is that Many of the other tools that we supply today when you talk about service can be asset specific by serial number, by any other uh, situation. In this case, the advantage is that uh, you are providing uh, uh, a mean uh, to offer solution to our customers that can cross over the, all the different uh, assets they can have on the floor. Uh, so we have to look at the cost in this perspective. So the hardware is uh, around uh, three thousand dollars. Depending, okay. we have uh, uh, two or three different options depending on the package. It can range from uh, twenty five hundred, twenty two hundred, up to thirty five hundred. Uh, and the licensing again, it depends on the users, but is around one hundred fifty dollar, one hundred seventy dollar per month uh, for the platform. Now, more importantly, is uh, to go against. What's your cost per hour when you, are, when you, are, you, when you have a downtime? Uh, the cost to deploy a technician, because that's the alternative. Um, so the logistic, uh, the travel time, the time to respond. So if we look at it with this perspective, it's incredibly efficient. Okay. So Mike, I want to turn to you uh, at Accenture. You're kind of deep in the weeds here. Um, mm -hmm. You've done some work for the giant uh, aircraft maker, Airbus. Sure. So take us through a little bit about what, what they, they were trying to do and, and what you helped them do with regards to manufacturing fuselage, fuselages in, in, in airplanes. Well, you know, what we heard from Giuseppe and also from Barbara is that everybody is trying to understand how to rethink manufacturing, remove bottlenecks, remove downtime, 
and improve the, uh, the productivity of what they're doing. In the aircraft industry, once the fuselage is created, it's just a big empty cylinder, and they've got to create lots of different holes in it. Each hole has to be in the precise location and the precise size that they need, and there are thousands of them that need to be drilled. Uh, and so it's a manual process. There's literally people with drills that go in, and they measure exactly, and they get the right drill bit, and they punch a hole. If they make a mistake, it's really expensive. And so they you know, measure twice and cut once. Um, and so they said, what? Well, there's got to be a faster way because this is the bottleneck to the rest of the production process. So they just used virtual reality, put an augmented set of glasses on uh, so that when the person is looking, they're seeing what they're actually seeing without the glasses, but superimposed on that is a laser that says, this is exactly where you're supposed to be drilling the hole, and this is exactly the size, and here's, here are the next eight that you need to drill with the same bit so you're not constantly changing bits. Uh, and that improved the, the productivity of that workforce by 500%. Wow. Now, it's a small work group because there are not that many people in there doing it at the time, but what's important is it removed a big bottleneck in the production process. So what we're seeing is people can take a fairly simple technology. This, you know, the glasses cost a couple thousand dollars, as you just heard. It's not super expensive to do. But if it's the bottleneck that you need to remove, it's worth making the investment. That's what I wanted to ask about was it's a, you know, I used to cover airlines, and I was a, an airline reporter here for uh, covering Delta, and so I'm generally familiar with aircraft. Mm -hmm. And taking a drill and, and drilling specific holes in the fuselage seems like a very narrow use for this technology. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, do you have to create you know, new software and, and you know, all, you can replicate the system over and over every time you want to do a different, you want to do something else to the fuselage? Are these systems set up so that you could do multiple uses with? You know, how does that work? Well, you're seeing a couple things happen. First of all, the digital technologies are relatively inexpensive to access, right? So um, you can experiment, do pilots and proof of concepts and prototypes for very little investment. But then you're seeing people like Siemens come into the market with platforms that, like MindSphere that provide a consistent platform you could choose to develop on. And in that environment, you could say, um, you know, we're going to have some IoT applications, some virtual reality applications, maybe some machine learning optimization applications, but we want them all sitting on a common platform so they can share data and maybe integrate across a, a wider set of um, hardware. And so it's both. It's, you know, very inexpensive experimentation, but it's also trying to do something at scale, and you're seeing a lot of innovation in both, both parts of the market. Okay. One of the other things I wanted to ask you about was just whether companies should embark on this themselves. I mean, do they have the software horsepower to develop these kind of systems? Do they have to hire an outsider? Um, take, and, and, and if somebody's really got deep pockets, do they purchase some company with technology to do this? Take us through the process of uh, how do you um, how do you just decide to get into this and, and, and what's the right model for you? Well, again, I think you know different horses for different courses. So there are lots of college kids coming out who are well trained in the base technologies and can experiment for you and do proof of concepts for very little money. So there's no reason not to experiment. And you just heard Barbara talk about what's going on out in Silicon Valley. I mean, most of the Silicon Valley teams are three or four people that graduated last year. And they've just got an idea on how they're going to innovate around a particular problem. Uh, what they need is the industry expertise to know which problems to solve. And then you have the equipment manufacturers and other platform providers coming in and saying, you know, we've got software engineers, we've got data scientists, we've got computer technicians, whatever you need. We'll collaborate with you to figure out how to take our equipment, put it into your environment in a more efficient way. So I don't think you have to own it internally. I think there are lots of people in the ecosystem who are happy to co-innovate with you. And um, at certain points of scale, you might say, I, I want to add more internally and own it myself. But I wouldn't start there. OK. I want to turn to Arya now, who's at Emory University. And I have to confess, when we first had our <laughs> discussion, I, I was really lost. Uh, he gets into really some. some uh, some challenging things there uh, techn technologically. Uh, I remember when I was, I was getting an MBA 10 years ago or so, and I delved a little bit into this, and I remember coming across something called a virtual keyboard, which completely floored me. If you haven't seen this thing, you can have a computer, and it zaps a, an image of a keyboard onto the table uh, in front of you, and you can pl actually play around with it. It interacts, and the, 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 it shows up on your computer screen, or it, it actually types. Um, 
However, uh, 10 years later, I, can't, I confess I haven't seen a single virtual keyboard being used. And we had a conversation the other day on the phone that just because you can do something and spend money on something doesn't mean it's going to take off. One of the other applications is uh, 3D televisions um, that I, I, I think have uh, generally not taken off. So take me through from an academic perspective. You see this all the time. Uh, what happened to the to the the virtual keyboard? Uh, is anybody using it, and why are they not using it? And what does that say about whether this is a, a waste of time or not? Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, so, I think your observation of the virtual keyboard. Yeah. Uh, can Can you all? Um, no. Hello. Like handheld. Hey. Um, yeah. So, uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, the virtual keyboard example um, is a very astute one. I remember seeing that myself um, a couple of years ago. And uh, the, the reason that it didn't take off is because the work to make it work is just too much. I mean, if you have a, a keyboard lying around, you can just plug it into the USB and it works. So sometimes we have to find out, uh, we have to do extensive feasibility analysis of um, like how much it's going to be, the, the real meaningfulness of the technology in its application. And, and we've got to you know, prioritize that given the context. Um, such as the same example for 3D tele televisions. Um, I remember that when I first interfaced with the technology, um, it works either actively or passively, but then you have to wear a um, glass at the least to uh, make it work. And then not all the time the angle, the perspective works for you. So it's not a, the ubiquity of the technology was not 100%. I mean, it worked, but certain cases. So my point with that is like, uh, be it the academy or the industry, feasibility analysis and the extensibility of that is very important. No. Um, and, and, and I've expertise myself in, in actually tackling the human issues in, in interfacing with any new technology. So uh, for the last couple of years, I've been running uh, user studies uh, at the University of Georgia and now at Emory University, um, trying to uh, come up with scenarios where technology does, does work. I mean, specifically virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, and mixed reality. Um, and the, and, the, and the, the first thing I notice is the weight of the components. So you cannot have people wearing a, a lot of hardware. Uh, it just wears them down. And then um, the other thing is that you cannot have, um, I mean, it's, I guess we start simple with a toyish example, like, you know, let's move this little bit of cube in virtual reality from this place to this place. And that is fine and it works flawlessly, but then we don't really apply anything going on from there. Um, so I found like the lack of specific use cases uh, and the research that goes into like uh, identifying, okay, how do I apply this to the real world? And, uh, and the other thing that Giuseppe and my, uh, um, uh, Michael, uh, you brought up is the, but the one thing that we don't really consider is the, uh, the transfer of skills. So if you have a, a, a regular mechanic or a person drilling holes, yeah. you know, <laughs> Um, do we really evaluate how much of transfer of skills is happening when we go from the real world to the virtual, and vice versa? I mean, it's a two-way street. So mm -hmm. those kind of studies have to be deployed more and more, and that's what I do in my uh, in my in my own backyard. Yeah, one of the things uh, I think it'll come up later as well. Uh, one of the things I've discovered about doing some of this research is there's something called mixed reality annotation, and this this really floored me when I was uh, looking at it. It means you can actually make a, a circle with you usually literally using your finger or draw uh, an arrow in space and it shows up in your virtual world and so if you have that clock there that's staring at me I could sit here and circle it and it shows up in my virtual world um, now one of the things I, I've always been a little bit of a shy person so the idea that I'm sitting here in space making crazy hand motions and whatnot uh, I'm not sure I'd want to do that. Um, I, I, there was a, a video that, that we may see later from Microsoft regarding his moving stuff. Um, are people comfortable with that? Is there a, a sort of an awkwardness about doing some of these things in space? Certainly, Mike. So there is uh, the social awkwardness component to doing something alone, for sure. I mean, if you're the only person doing that, uh, let's say, uh, in a realistic situation, you'll stand, you'll stand up. Um, for sure, and I've spent that time, and I've desensitized myself by trying out new things in front of people. Oh. Excuse this for me, sorry. <laughs> hello, hello. 
It doesn't work either. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See yeah, how technology speak, breaks. Speak, <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. So, um, I've seen social uh, component, the social awkwardness component come up uh, every now and then. So, it's important to also, um, you know, when designing such technology, keep that in mind that um, how the, the variables for sure. I mean, uh, for example, the, the smart watches have blended well because they're just another watch. Um, but a smart glass is not irregular glass and it, it has bulk on it, it has batteries and stuff that's communicating with other devices. So uh, we have to get into the design aspects of it. Like um, we have to also study, I haven't done it myself, but I think we have to do uh, a, a second round of, or more rounds of feasibility analysis of how accepted it, this design is. Um, I've, I've, I've tried HoloLens by Microsoft. Microsoft. Right. I've tried um, other devices. They're not that bad, but it's still, you know, it, it is not, everyone's not wearing that yet. Right. So there will be that component of social awkwardness. Yeah. I wanted to open this up to the panel now. Uh, a lot of the, the companies that are, are here and are doing mixed reality and augmented reality are using it in some repair, kind of a fix a glitch mm -hmm. scenario. Uh, I mean, Airbus is more of the manufacturing how much of this is really practical for, you know, you're, you're actually manufacturing an item versus uh, this is the, the, the repair of problem. You're using it, I think, just just to be in more of the repair context, but your people, Mike, are using it more for, uh, well, at least some in the manufacturing. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll just give you a really simple example. Um, so we work with a lot of the high-end automotive manufacturers in seat assembly. And in seat assembly, you're taking leather and you're stretching it across a seat and you want it to be perfect before you stitch it. And if at any point in that process you get a wrinkle, you've just ruined the seat. And so they asked us to put video cameras on the line and do real-time video analytics of the person stretching the material and to have the system basically light up green when it's okay to stitch and, and not until it is. And so that took their, their error rate on those seats down from a historical number that had never moved because you know the humans are only so good at doing this, but with the precision of high definition video in real time, they could have basically an assistant basically watching what they were doing and saying, "Okay, you've got it right. Now start stitching." It's a real time production process that uses a very simple video camera, high definition machine learning to recognize what a wrinkle looks like in leather. But once you've done it, you put it into production very inexpensively. Okay. Yeah. So it's not it's not that difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and Giuseppe, are, are any of your folks, are you using virtual or di uh, mixed reality or any of these applications in actually making stuff, or is it primarily fixing repair at work right now? Uh, the example that we discussed today about the repair, the post sales, is something that is uh, working in place, uh, very accessible, and um, um, very economically effective. Um, we, we use the mix uh, uh, reality um, when we have to project and design line articulated um, uh, processes where you have multiple technologies lined up. It's very difficult to have a, 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 a flow, a proper flow uh, in the process line. So let's use the real example in our industry. If you have to produce a piece of furniture, a cabinet, you have multiple components that have to go through different operations. So um, it's necessary that we create a flow that takes care of the limitation on the space, so the layout in the customer facility, and how the different technology integrate to each other, not just the machine, but also the unloading, the, uh, unloading and loading of the machines, robotics, other integration. So we have this platform that we call uh, Explore in our, in our toolbox, in our digital toolbox, that we use uh, to plan this line and this factory key and solution for our customer. Of course, today is a solution that we use for medium high projects. It's something that um, um, still there isn't a, a, a proper payback on standalone technologies. But for projects of a certain level of difficulties is, uh, is, uh, is a reality and we use it uh, uh, quite extensively. Okay. Uh, and, and just, Mike, just talk a little bit about, there's something called a digital twin. Mm -hmm. Talk about what a, that's a little bit different from augmented reality, I think. Sure. Um, but it is in this kind of general space. What, uh, 
take us through what is a digital twin and uh, how are you helping companies do it? Well, a, a, a digital twin is a very well-known part of the industry. It's been out there for 20 years where people have taken CAD CAM systems and recreated a virtual uh, replica of what they're physically going to produce. What's different today is that we can make those digital twins live and we can create a digital thread that tracks how that product has evolved from design through manufacturing, planning, manufacturing, and support. And we can actually not only create a digital twin of the product itself, we can create a digital twin of the manufacturing process. And then we can start to simulate how that, that process is going to work. And so the, um, the question in the industry is, how easy is it to get access to the content that other people have created on individual components that you might be using in your manufacturing process or the machines that you're going to be using so that you can create real-time virtual reality versions of what you're doing in the physical space. If it's done correctly, we can actually have correct physics of performance on how something's going to perform before we've actually built it. As an example, we're doing something in the oil and gas industry right now for one of our clients uh, where they're taking a brownfield environment with lots of existing pumps, valves, you know, different pressure and, and throughput, and they're saying we want to simulate how the system's going to perform if we do three or four different types of design for an expansion of the system. And so, in, in, you know, we've always been able to do that on paper. Now we can actually put it into a virtual reality environment. We can simulate it so that humans can understand it in real time, and then the engineers can collaborate from multiple places around the world in a virtual environment to say, okay, now we see what you're all talking about. We can make real-time engineering decisions, and then once we've all decided, we'll actually go and build it physically. So it's just a, it's another tool that we have in the toolkit to help people collaborate, to help people understand what the numbers and the designs are actually telling us, and then in some cases to actually simulate before we build physically so that we know we're not wasting time and money. Let's talk, talk just for a minute about money and how much, I mean, uh, Giuseppe, you said $3,000 for the hardware and maybe a hundred and something dollars per month. How much does it, it's a ballpark, does it cost for a company to, to, to design and implement a rudimentary augmented reality or a mixed reality? You know, you know, are we talking hundreds of thousands, millions? I mean, what, in case of the uh, solution we presented here today, uh, we are in the hundred of thousand. Uh, the main investment is the time and the development of the software. That's the main asset required. Um, the hardware, uh, we decided, we, we said we, we was a choice, it was a strategic choice uh, to, to, to find something already available in the market. And uh, what we spoke before is very much true. The two or three options that are available, are uh, all three equally good, but they are, uh, they are the result of different preferences of the users. One is lighter, one is heavier, one uh, create, creating more dizziness than others. Uh, so that's the reason why there are these options. So the investment uh, in this case uh, was reasonable considering the, the, the arena where we are playing and the payback was, uh, was, was quick uh, for us. And, for our customer too. So this experience was a success, for sure. Did you say 100,000? It was in the 100,000, uh, it was around uh, 250, 300,000 investment, uh, uh, just the uh, investment uh, to create the platform. Then uh, we have all the hours on top of that. Okay. And Mike, is that pretty, is that, is that pretty standard? Uh, a few hundred thousand? <clears throat> Well, yes, I mean, for, um, for, for a simple version of what you're trying to achieve, you can do it for a lot less if you're just doing a very rapid pilot or a prototype, and you could spend millions if you're trying to do it across 100 different plants. So it depends on what level you're trying to deploy it. But yes, a couple hundred thousand dollars is a reasonable estimate to get started. Okay, well, that's, we're, that's it. Well, thank you for your time, and uh, we'll, we'll move on to the thank next you. session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.